Have you ever wondered what kinds of data you should be collecting and storing and how you can tell if the data that you're getting is accurate and informational? That's what we'll talk about today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Start With Small Steps podcast. Things get done only if the data we gather can inform and inspire those in a position to make a difference. Mike Schmoker, results. Today, we're going to talk about how to curate data. It suddenly realized to me how important curation is for almost everything I do when it comes to my work world, when it comes to my home life, but now even more so that I have a podcast. I pour through a lot of books. I read a lot of books. I read a lot of articles. I listen to many podcasts. And how do I decide what it is I'm going to pair down when it comes to data, what it is I'm going to share with all of you, and what methods can I use to store that data? This is suddenly becoming a very big topic out there in the podcast and blogging and YouTube video world. There's a fellow named Tiago Forte, and he started this second brain revolution. Everyone's wondering, how can we take technology and turn it into our second brain? And from my understanding of his story is he had some illness, and he was trying to process a lot of information about what was going on with his health. And it started making him wonder, how can I store this data about his own health in such a way that he can retrieve it again, that he knows it's worthwhile to retrieve again, that set everyone on fire, essentially, in the podcasting and YouTube world about how can we do this, quote, second brain. In the future, I plan on reviewing his book about how to create a second brain. But today we're going to back it up just a little bit more into how can I tell what's a valid piece of data to share with all of you? I feel some sense of responsibility to make sure that the data I share is worthwhile, is accurate, is something that's beneficial to the work you are interested in doing. Also, as I'm bringing up three additional podcasts that have varying degrees of information curation, it made me realize how important it is to me to curate good data, but it's the one thing that ties all my podcasts together. That's essentially my gift right then and there. I'm good at taking in a bunch of data, processing it, and then bringing it out in the right event. When I'm at a customer site and they're asking me questions about software adoption, I'm able to pull from that data and find answers for them. If I'm talking about a podcast and it has to do with how the brain works or the various biases and structures we have in our thinking process, I have a pretty good structure for pulling that data out too. So that's why I thought I would share this particular aspect with you first, and then we'll talk a little bit later on about what can we do to actually store that information. It's becoming clear that curation of information is really important. In fact, I'm starting to see actual careers out there of people whose whole job it is to curate information. And that is because there's so much information out there. There's also so much misinformation out there, or maybe even gray information where it's not right, it's not maybe even necessarily wrong, but it will lead you to the wrong conclusions. So what can we do to process all that data and turn it into something that we can store? I think in the end that if you're good at data curation, there's a lot of ways that you can use that ability. For example, you could be in a podcast where you take essentially what I'm doing, but maybe other topics too, about books and articles and magazines and podcasts and synthesize them down into a usable amount of data. You know, when I read you a book, you know, even when you're talking about like 4,000 Weeks by Oliver Burke, that is a very dense, long book. And so my job, my thinking about it is, how can I relate to you what this book is about and give you an idea about maybe whether or not you want to read this book, go into a further dive, or maybe this book isn't really the problem you're trying to solve. And that's where we're going to start this whole process off. So first of all, whenever you're talking about curating data, the first 
step in this is to gather information, obviously. If I'm going to do a podcast about how the ninjas in their earliest age ended up having the discipline to become ninjas, I'm going to have to start somewhere where I'm gathering the information. And so that's when research becomes the primary focus, how you're going to research the data so that you can, first of all, understand your topic better then you can also make it valuable to other people. If you're researching something for your family, how can you find data that's going to make your family better or your work better? How am I going to research something to make this podcast have a good episode? And that's the important piece of it. So when you're researching it, you have to really look for, first of all, high quality data. If you wanted to know secretly what my brain is filled with, It is filled with trivia. I go and win trivia contests because I know so much garbage that is completely inactionable, unreliable, and has no basic value but winning trivia contests. But in this case, when you're doing something with the data, you want to make sure that it's high quality, that it either leads to a change in thinking or it leads into a change of action or it provides a history so that you can understand a problem better. High quality data is the beginning of any kind of research process. And then finding data that allows your family, your work, your podcast to be able to advance, to be able to give a strong opinion, a good advice. And that's really where that data becomes important. When I was in college, I had a funny process, and you can listen to my college roommate, who is going to be someone I'm going to be doing a podcast with shortly, but we would have two processes when we had a paper we had to write. She would get some books that she thought were very good books about what she was going to write a paper about, and then she would read those books, she'd go through them, she'd get the references of them, and basically take all the good details out of them. Meanwhile, I was someone who would actually stay at the library and get 14 times the amount of books I actually need, look at all of them, decide which ones were the strongest ones. Then I would go through and partially read all of those books to see if there were any kinds of details in those books I could take out of them for this paper. And then I would go back with maybe one or two of those books, all of my notes, and start writing my paper. My workload was high at the beginning of the process of writing a paper, but because I had so many resources and angles and opinions about it, it got better once I was writing the paper. While my friend, Wendy, she would actually go through and have this high quality document, that one or two books, she would read it thoroughly, but maybe she would actually have to go back to the library or do a little bit more research because there was a particular angle that wasn't there. Or she would limit her paper to those particular aspects. Both of these are good examples about how to curate. Do you start with a lot of data and then pare it down into quality data? Or do you get the best data at the very beginning and just stick with that? Maybe add a little bit on later. Both of them are just different ways of getting to the same place. And you can decide which method works best for you. The important thing, too, when looking at data is that you look to see that the data is actually based on multiple people's opinions, either through polling or research that's going on. Because the important thing to know is that if someone is telling you a story about a particular situation, maybe they're telling you a story about how someone brought themselves out of poverty. That story can be inspiring can be informational, but it may not be how everyone gets themselves out of poverty. It may be just a story of that particular person. When you're looking at data and you're trying to make a wide assumption about what's going on in a particular situation, this one story is not maybe reflective of a lot of people's stories. When it comes to content curation, one of the best ways to think about it is think about it when you go to a museum. Go to the Smithsonian, you go to the Art Institute in Chicago, 
all the different places that you can go to get information from a museum. But if the curation of the museum isn't very good, you go to an art museum and you start seeing bad art, or maybe you start seeing things that aren't art at all. Or if you go to a natural history museum and you start seeing things that isn't related to natural history, you actually start wondering who it was that decided this should be in the museum. And the museum itself loses its impact. That's the idea about curation, that something has to fit the theme, the age, the time period, whatever the museum's about, the various entries in the museum have to actually fit exactly what it is the museum's about, regardless of what topic that museum is. When you're deciding to write a plan for this curation of details, you want to make sure that you have an idea of what the mission is. You know, if you were in a business, you would be writing a charter. You can still write a charter. I'm writing charters for all the podcasts I'm doing and scope to say that this particular podcast, this one right here, is approximately 17 minutes long. It's about actionable details. It's about giving people something that they can decide if they want to read more about or if this podcast was enough. You have to be able to identify what rules you have about it. For instance, I never get involved in politics. I never tell you something that is to hurt another person. I have my own policies when it comes to this podcast. Then with this plan that you're creating, you'll want to know who your listeners are, who your target audience is, the readers of your blog article, so that you understand what it is. You're going to have to understand what technology you're going to use to collect this data. Is this all information on a computer? Is this all information you're going to write on notes or you're going to record audio for it? But what kind of technical infrastructure do you need in order to get this data properly organized? For a podcast, it's pretty simple. I use my computer to collect the data. I have an idea who my target audience is. I understand the costs involved in it and what resources it takes for me in order to get this podcast done. Some data that I collect when I'm considering this podcast would be books, web articles, other podcasts that are out there, newsletters, Substacks, Twitter. I'm gathering information from all sorts of different technology inputs so that I can process that information for you. And then putting it in a format that makes it easier for you to digest and easier for you to act on and easier for you to understand if you want to read more about it. Once you've collected all of this data, is to determine how you can make it your own. It'd be pretty terrible if I took a book and just read you the book. Didn't come up with my own comments, didn't give you my own opinion about it, because in the end, that's what a podcast is. It's about taking all these bits of information and trying to present it in a new way, trying to present it with a new opinion or new experiences, or trying to present it in a way that it calls out a different action. By making it your own, you're taking someone's work and trying to cite your own experiences, your own expertise, and making it value added. Again, I'm not reading to you other people's books. I am telling you a synthesized version of it with my own experiences that are there. And hopefully figuring out how you, the listener, can make good use of that data. The idea is not to republish, to reprint, to plagiarize anybody else's details, but instead add value to what I'm reading. Take the data that you've been collecting, you've been curating, you gave it your own bent, is to get it out there. How can you help people find your data? If I do a podcast on how to get over worry, how can I find listeners who may be worried and wondering what they can do to move beyond this now? That's an important step about how we can get past this so that people can use the data. So for me, I'm looking for audience members who may be interested in this topic. For other people, for blog writers, they'll be looking for people who can read their blog and get more information out of it. And then the important thing is making sure that you always give a proper attribution to whoever it is that you're reading, that you're talking about, 
that you're referring to. There's this one fellow who I won't name right now, but many people do podcasts about his book. Give this one direct quote directly from his book without ever saying it came from his book. And it drives me absolutely crazy because they're essentially taking an idea. Of course, they're making it their own in the end, so it's not plagiarism, but they're not even referring to the original author who wrote it. It's important to give that attribution, not only because it makes me feel like I thanked someone in some way for giving me this great idea or letting me think about something, but also because it allows you, the listener, to know where you could find out more information about it. And then comes the paring down. You know, I think the last step is then curating your curated information. There's a lot of details that you can give out there. There's a lot of information that you can process when it comes to doing a podcast or a blog article or a book, but making sure that you cut down on how much information you're giving because you want this to be concise. They always say that the best rule when it comes to curating an idea, whether it comes to being written or a podcast or a YouTube video, is imagine you had to pay a dollar for every word. I know I say a lot of words. I talk a lot. It's my number one attribute, and I say it very fast. But in the course of this podcast, I'm always trying to be mindful of how it is I can cut down on that information so that it's more valuable to you. So my challenge to you is to think about how it is that you're curating your own data. Whenever it is you're trying to look up a particular topic, do some research on a particular issue, what process do you go to to make sure that you're getting good information that's accurate for your project? Then next week, we'll talk a little bit about how you can tell if your sources are valuable to whatever project you're working on. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you being out there. I hope you have a great week. Please remember that you can always email me if you have any questions about anything to jill at smallstepspod.com. And please remember to tell a friend that they can learn how to curate data better by taking small steps.